Hi, so what I want to do to start us off is to um, give a kind of overview of the period we're going to be looking at and some of the issues involved in this period that really shape what the art looks like, what artists were doing, why they were able to have the careers that they had or didn't have in this period. To do that, I'll start with Vasari, whose portrait we see here. Giorgio Vasari was a Tuscan artist. He was born in Arezzo, but moved to Florence and spent most of his career there working for uh, the Dukes and Grand Dukes of Tuscany who had their court in Florence. Vasari is so important to us because he is the one that makes um, two books, or rather an, a, two editions of one book that he wrote, which is called The Lives of the Artist. In this book, Vasari starts from what he sees as the beginning of the modern age with the late medieval artist Cimabue and Giotto and works his way through to talk about artists that Vasari was working with, his contemporaries. And it's an incredibly valuable resource for us in art history because he gives us a lot of information that otherwise we wouldn't have about, you know, the patrons and why they commissioned what they did and where things were. And he also gives us a lot of information about works of art that are no longer extant. So a very valuable resource for art history. The downside or maybe two downsides of Vasari, is that one, he tends to stretch the truth. And some of the stories that he tells are t told more for their anecdotal value than they are for a recording of historical truth. But that's kind of interesting as well. And, you know, by examining why he tells these stories, we can understand, you know, the motivations, um, the sort of social, political, and artistic reasons for the stories that Vasari tells and understand better the period in that way. The other downside of Vasari is that because he's working in Florence and is ingratiating himself to the Grand Duke of Tuscany, he absolutely neglects artists that are not working in Florence and especially those artists that are not working in what he sees as the Florentine style. He argues through the way that, you know, the, the artists that he chooses to include and the way he discusses them, what he's arguing is the absolute supremacy of Florentine art and, you know, that other art produced elsewhere, even within Italy, was subpar. And that's just not the truth and it has unfortunately caused uh, Renaissance art historians to focus more on Florence both because of the information we have and because of his assessment of Florentine art but since the 1980s we've really been working to move away from just looking at Vasari and trusting what he tells us and scholars have really worked to understand better the art that's produced in cities like Venice, Milan, Rome, Naples, and other places uh, where there were very important artists and artistic movements and some really amazing buildings and uh, sculptures and paintings and other kinds of um, decorative arts that were produced in this period. In this class, we will certainly be learning about uh, Florence and the great artists that worked there, but we will absolutely move away from Florence and talk about the artists like Titian, um, like Leone Leone, um, that were working outside of Florence and had really impressive careers. Sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. So, 
Um, the first place for us to look is at the city of Florence, and what you see in this is the Cathedral of Florence, Santa Maria del Fiore, which is what we see here. The baptistry sits right in front of it. This was a church that was built starting in the late 1200s and really exemplifies the achievements of the 15th century because in Florence, the architect Brunelleschi was the first to figure out how to build this expansive dome over that covered the end of the church. The Florentines had started building the cathedral knowing that they wanted a dome but not actually having the technological know-how of how they would accomplish a dome. The, the Romans had built domes the ancient Romans and the Florentines and everybody else were terribly impressed by these domes and they had absolutely no idea how they'd been built. That technology had been lost. The Romans had used concrete, that material, the knowledge of the material, how to make it and how to use it had been completely lost in the medieval period and so the Brunelleschi and the artist of his day had to come up with new um, new ways of making domes and other structures that they tried to emulate in you know trying to emulate what the Romans had done but without the technological advancements that the Romans uh, had come up with the rediscovery of the medium of concrete only happens in the course of the late 18th century and the recipe that the Romans used that worked so well was actually only discovered just a few years ago. The way art looks um, in this period, this period right when the cathedral is just starting to get underway, is very much rooted in the Byzantine style. Gold backgrounds, really flat figures, and there's a real rejection of those classicizing models, the way that uh, sculpture and painting looked like during the ancient Greek and Roman periods. That obviously changes, and the Cathedral of Florence's dome shows that, that in the 15th century and certainly in the 16th century, they are going back to those classicizing models, um, you know, and, and trying to recreate what those Roman models in particular look like. The Florentines argued, though wrongly, that their city had been a major Roman city uh, during the height of the ancient Roman Empire. It was not. It was a very provincial little town, not really notable for anything, but the Florentines just kind of in the 15th century start fudging that history and say that Julius Caesar built it and that there were still some ancient Roman monuments around. Um, they actually weren't ancient Roman, um, that, but they argued that they were and that those were proof of uh, the importance of Florence during that period. And in the course of the 15th century, because of an economic boom, um, because of the industries of Florence, banking and textiles, Florence has more expendable wealth and more money is put into rebuilding the city. And the way that they describe some of these building projects that are undertaken in that period is that they are making Florence the new Rome. And so we can see the importance of those Roman models for the Florentines as they try to, you know, bring Florence to the level that Rome enjoyed during the ancient Roman period is really the capital of the world. So these Byzantine models that we see in painting for religious painting specifically um, hang on for a while, but we'll see them dissolve uh, certainly during the 15th century and in their full bloom in the 16th century as classicizing um, painting styles become more and more important. In the Byzantine period, it's not that they didn't know how to make their figures look three-dimensional and construct three-dimensional space. It's that they don't want their religious figures to look that way. They don't want them to mimic 
real life. So they make them flat uh, in these otherworldly settings shown by these gold backgrounds so that a, the person looking at the altarpiece, the worshiper in front of the altarpiece, doesn't think that this is someone like them. This is someone in a whole different realm of existence than they are. That idea of that separation between the worshiper and the image changes significantly in the course of the 15th century and certainly in the 16th century as they try to make the religious figures accessible and make them look more human-like in human settings, um, though beautified, um, but, you know, make it more human-like, more naturalistic. When we start to see this change take place um, is with Giotto, and we see that it is early as the beginning of the 14th century. Giotto was really interested in creating a more recognizable three-dimensional space, and even the facial types that he used are, you know, believable as just people you would see on the street. And that's, that's a significant switch from what we see just a few years earlier in this Byzantine-style altarpiece. On the other hand, we still have the use of the gold background, and the spatial issues are not ac absolutely worked out. There's still some problems. Uh, you can tell, for example, with the use of the halos and that these angels seem to be on bleachers of some sort. They're still trying to figure out how can you show a crowd around um, a throne or other structure in a limited space available in the composition. And it's not perfect, right? But he's really working on it. There is, um, especially with Giotto, we see this return to the monumentality of the figure. The figures really seem to have a weight about them. And he achieves that through the modeling of the figure to make the flesh look more like flesh, to make the fabric, you know, using color modeling, really make that fabric look and behave like fabric. And he does that so well, especially, I think you can see in the lap of the Virgin, that beautiful fold of the drape of the Virgin is, is just masterful. The problem with Giotto is that he really didn't have that many followers that took up this style and kept going with it. And so we have Giotto and then things just kind of drop off until we get really to the 15th century. And the artist Masaccio, um, whose holy trinity you see here, is a great example of that. He really picks up from Giotto's lessons and tries to make religious figures look more human-like and have them be in spaces that are identifiably three-dimensional. They're certainly also looking back at Roman models, and you can see that especially in the incorporation of the triumphal arch motif has very Roman classicizing um, decoration on it. And so looking at those Roman models and then kind of um, updating the kinds of religious figures that we see in them, looking so monumental, like they really do have weight and their faces look realistic. So that's a major change that happens with Masaccio. An artist from Masaccio on in Florence are using one point perspective. They've worked out the system so that they can construct um, this vanishing point and all of the lines lead back to it so that the viewer's eye is led back and this illusion of three dimensionality is created. So that was a major achievement of the 15th century in Florence. So I've mentioned already this uh, interest in ancient Roman architecture in particular and Brunelleschi's great achievement in coming up with new ways to construct a dome. I won't go into all of those uh, advances that Brunelleschi makes to make his dome possible, but you can see that the Pantheon really was the model for Brunelleschi, but that he had to make certain and important alterations to the model of the, the Pantheon by making the dome higher pitched, 
um, among other things, so that the dome could stay intact. But the achievement of this dome really did elevate, um, certainly in the minds of the Florentines, but also of cities nearby in particular that would have known about the dome, it really elevated that concept of Florence rising as the new Rome and of this particular Florentine ingenuity that they were able to achieve this dome when no one else could. In the area of the cathedral, you have the baptistry, this building that sits in front of it, where the Florentines would be baptized and thus enter in both into Florentine society, into the religious, um, the faith of the Florentines. And you had to do that, you do it as an infant, but you had to do that before you were then able to enter into the sacred space of the cathedral. The baptistry is a building that the Florentines very wrongly said was an ancient Roman temple. They said it was a temple to Mars. It was not. It was built during the Romanesque period in 1059 is when it starts to be constructed. And so well after the fall of Rome and a long medieval interval between did they not know anymore in the 15th century that it was an ancient Rome, that it was not an ancient Roman temple? Um, or did they, in, so did they intentionally fudge the story or not? That we don't know. Um, but in any case, they argue that this is an ancient Roman temple. And as such, the baptistry serves as an important model in the development of Renaissance architecture in Florence especially with the use of the repeated arch pattern and this use of a dark and light stone, pretty geometric patterning on the exterior. We see that mimicked all over Florence uh, in the architecture built in the Renaissance because they think that it's going back to Florence's ancient Roman roots. In the 15th century, we also see um, the introduction of new kinds of subject matter. I'm sorry the date appears to be cut off, but it, this is a painting from 1482. It is The Birth of Venus by Botticelli, another Florentine artist. And this is an important painting for many reasons, but we especially see embodied in this painting the interest of the Florentines and those of other people of other cities in Italy in this period of a move away from exclusively doing religious painting. This is obviously a mythological tale. And they're using models like uh, ancient Greco-Roman statuary of Venus that shows the goddess in this pose. Um, so they're, they're kind of lifting from these ancient sources and replicating them, uh, reusing them in their own work. Um, and this is, you know, a perfect example of doing that. Um, those models of the Venus statue that this is mimicking were well known. There were many copies of them around Italy um, and even beyond. And so this would have been easily identifiable, the source of this. David is an important symbol of Florence. This is true um, even well before the 15th century, but we have great artists of the 15th century like Donatello, a sculptor who is really seeking to humanize the figure, to really make the figure look like, you know, to study anatomy and make the, it, the approach to the figure much more scientifically based. Um, this is David, the adolescent, who um, was able to uh, outdo Goliath and conquer him. And in fact, we see that David has already severed the head of the giant Goliath, and the head is actually under the foot of David here. This was an important Florentine symbol, a symbol that was associated with the Florentine Republic, especially Florence had a Republican government. It was a very strongly uh, supported government, and the Florentines really were um, 
you know, had this sort of anxiety about maintaining the Republic, especially because the powerful family, the Medici, the great bankers of Florence, really worked on uh, achieving a political uh, dominance over the city of Florence and in fact really achieved that by the end of the 15th century and in fact in the 16th century while there will be moments when the Medici are not in power for the most part they are the rulers of Florence by the end of the period that we're looking at they are the absolute authority in Florence and not just Florence they take over the whole region of Florence all of Tuscany Another David image, perhaps much more famous than Donatello's, is, of course, Michelangelo's statue of David. And this is a very highly politically charged sculpture. It still uh, is from, well, I should say, it's, it's from, it was commissioned in a period when the Medici had been exiled from Florence, so they were at least temporarily out of power in Florence. And David was commissioned um, eventually to go in front of the government building in Florence and serve as a warning that the Florentine people, like David, would fight off any tyrant. And for them in this moment, the Medici family really represented that tyranny that they wanted to fight off. David is situated in such a way that he sort of aimed towards Rome and that, in fact, is where the Medici family had been exiled. And so he's really meant to be understood as a warning to the Medici family. Obviously, we'll be talking about Michelangelo's David a lot more. But I would say, before I move on, that Michelangelo's David certainly represents that interest of the Renaissance artist to at least emulate what Greek and Roman artists had been able to achieve, if not outdo it. David is a colossal statue, and the Florentine, the Renaissance artists knew that the uh, Greek artists had started making these colossal figures, and they wanted to be able to do the same thing. Colossal just means anything over life size, and David is about 18 feet tall, so he certainly achieved that here. The uh, nude figure is also something that we see as an important theme uh, in Greco-Roman sculpture, especially Greek sculpture, of the uh, beauty of the male body and the male body representing virtue. And that's an important part of the meaning of this statue as well. There were uh, particular sculptures that are uncovered in the course of the 16th century that have a huge impact on artists. So they're doing excavations in Rome and are uncovering statues that they had only known about through descriptions uh, from the Romans that recorded what they looked like. Um, and this one is a particularly important um, sculpture that was uncovered in 1505. Michelangelo just happened to be there when the sculpture was uncovered in Rome and they immediately recognized it as a sculpture group that Pliny had talked about and were so taken aback by the drama of the representation here and the treatment especially of the body of Laocoon. Another sculpture located during this period is the Belvedere Torso and it has that same sort of approach, that use of torsion, this twisting of the torso, so that you really see that muscular strain. They loved that. And Michelangelo, in particular, uses that idea of torsion after he sees these two sculptures and is really so affected by them. We see that, for example, as Michelangelo is working on the Sistine Chapel ceiling and the kinds of uh, the treatment of some of the figures is absolutely based on what he's seen in the Belvedere torso. So again, artists are looking at those ancient precedents and trying to at least do as well as they did, if not outdo them.
just have them see some of these figures as they are then translated into the fresco. Needless to say, we'll be spending quite a bit of time on Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling um, as we cover that material in the course of this class. I won't linger on it anymore. But another good example, why not? Something fascinating about this period is the kind of changes that we see in style. They are dramatic changes that happen in style in this period, especially in Florence, but not exclusively. And just to short, sort of give you a preview of what some of that stylistic change looks like, we go from the absolute serenity and stability of the pyramidal composition that Raphael uses, these beautiful figures of the Virgin, the Child, and St. John. Um, you know, they look at nature and then they try to elevate nature. They try to perfect nature. And so absolutely idealized, beautiful figures in perfect landscapes. That's what the High Renaissance is all about. Raphael Michelangelo in this sort of early 16th century period and Leonardo are all interested in those aspects. But then we get to the 1520s and things start to change in important ways. And we have this artist, Pontormo, also a Florentine artist, who certainly knew Raphael's work well, um, but goes in an entirely different direction. He breaks all of the rules that are established about, uh, say, the perfectly symmetrical and stable compositions of the High Renaissance period and that interest in showing three-dimensional depth, as we see in Raphael's example. And instead, we lose our sense of space. This is in kind of a settingless, unidentifiable place. You've got figures whose bodies are distorted, elongated, positioned strangely in poses they couldn't possibly actually hold, um, tiny little heads on long bodies, strange coloration, strange facial expressions. Um, it's just a lot of weird stuff going on in this work. Um, and it, you know, really goes against that sense of the color harmony that you see in Raphael, and instead you have all of these clashing colors, all intentionally done, of course. And there are a bunch of artists that are working in this new style that some art historians call mannerism. And we'll talk about why this style change happens. Um, there are political and social reasons why these we start to see these changes take place in the work that Florentine artists are producing. It's a fascinating period um, because there are so many major things that happen in the course of the 16th century. There are serious debates about religion. You have the rise of the Protestants. You have the, the Catholic response to the Protestants in the form of the Counter-Reformation. Um, you have major um, political issues, territorial struggles that happen in Italy and elsewhere in Europe in this period. You have the plague that's going through repeatedly and other um, disease and other sorts of hardships that take place that have an enormous impact on the population. And of course, we see that echoed in their art and architecture as well. By the end of the period that we'll be looking at, we'll see, in fact, how yet another style emerges at the end of the 16th century. And this is a famous example by the great artist Caravaggio, who handles light very differently, he handles the treatment of the religious figure depicted very differently from what we see the High Renaissance and certainly the Mannerist artists doing. Um, and we'll talk about the reasons why Caravaggio and his contemporaries paint in the way that they do, especially as they are working in Rome. So that gives you a good overview of what we'll be looking at this semester. And I'm very much looking forward to guiding you through this truly fascinating 
period filled with what I think, of course, is the most beautiful art uh, produced in Italy um, in its history, though I'm a little bit biased in thinking that way. But I, I hope that you will um, really enjoy the art that we are going through and gain a great appreciation for why this period still is regarded as such an important turning point in history and in art history as well. Thanks.